So I'm continuing on with the dinosaur group series because I need structure to stop me slowly slipping into madness. So let's continue with Ankylosaurs. There aren't really many dinosaur archetypes that aren't iconic looking, but Ankylosaurs in particular are very unique, not just for dinosaurs, but for animals. In case you didn't know, Ankylosaurs are the group of dinosaurs that are the heavily armoured quadrupeds, often called nature's tanks. But you never know, you might walk past one in the street and never know. So let's take an in-depth look into what kind of animal an Ankylosaur actually was, followed by their evolutionary story. The group of Ankylosauria, which was named in 1923 by the famous Henry Fairfield Osborne, is a suborder of Thuriophorans. A particular clade of dinosaur is made up of any ornithischian that has longitudinal lines of osteoderms or skin bones that made up body armour. This clade includes ankylosaurs, stegosaurs and a few genera that lie somewhere in between. Ankylosaurs in particular are differentiated by having much wider, bulkier bodies with shorter legs, shorter and deeper skulls and most famously body armour that occupied rows that took up the entirety of the back rather than just a section running along the spine. None of them possess tail spikes or thagomizers either, with some instead using a giant solid ball of bone as a club on their tail. But not all members necessarily had this trait as we'll soon find out. And this armour estate before was made of osteoderms. Osteoderms are exactly what they say on the tin. Osteo meaning bone and derm meaning skin. Essentially these are lumps of bone that are not attached to the main skeleton and instead grow within the skin. Now this sounds like a really weird thing for an animal to do, but they're actually more common than you might think. Osteoderms can be found in countless reptiles, from lots of species of lizards, pretty much all crocodilians, and even, on the odd occasion, mammals such as armadillos. The purpose of osteoderms is quite simple. Protection. They serve as armour for the animal against predators or maybe even rivals of their own species. But as seen with crocodilians and a few dinosaurs like Stegosaurus, these osteoderms can also be highly vascularised helping the animal with thermoregulation by gaining or shedding heat. With ankylosaurs though, these were purely for protection. To what extent depended on the species, but even ankylosaurs with the least amount of body armour were still pretty impenetrable, with the plates taken on shapes like plates or spikes, lining the back and tail in transverse rows, forming a semicircle around the neck, and even giving the animal a helmet. The hell, these bony scoops even gave many members armoured eyelids. And then we get to that tail. Now what that tail and arm actually look like depends on what group we're talking about. Traditionally, though this was questioned last year, there are three groups of Ankylosauria. The first is the Parankylosaurids, a group that only contains three very basal genera from the southern hemisphere who were all relatively small, with not a lot of armour for this group and a tail that forms something in between a Stegosaurus's tail spikes and the classic tail club. The second family is called the Nodosaurids, which were medium to large in size, ranging from 5 to 19 feet long and up to 1.5 tons. These guys can be differentiated by having much spikier armour, but also a tail that was much more flexible and lacked a club at the end of it. Then the third family is the Ankylosaurids, which contains the main man himself, Ankylosaurus. Growing up to 8 metres or 26 feet long and up to 8 tons, these guys had slightly less armour that was more bumpy, not that they needed as much because these were the guys with the tail clubs. These were huge knotted lumps of bone at the end of an extremely stiffened tail, made so by a fused vertebra that allowed this club to be swung side to side with stability and a huge amount of power. Its structure was obviously for fighting since its function actually backs up its form, but not only was this used as self-defense against predators, ideally hitting the metatarsals of theropods, it was also found that this was likely used during intraspecific combat either for mating rights or over territory, the latter of which was probably especially common as I will expand on in a minute. Another classic feature of ankylosaurs is the remarkable complexity of their nasal passages. These passages loop and swell around in much more complex ways than most other vertebrates, and the reasoning for this has seen quite a few suggestions over the years, including helping to make a wide variety of sounds. Now, evidence for sound has been found, which I'll talk about soon, but it has now been settled on that ankylosaurs used these nasal passages to help heat exchange, cooling the air they breathed and ridding excess heat when they breathed out, a process helped along massively by the avian air sac system that all dinosaurs are thought to have had. 
Now, ankylosaurs have a reputation among paleontologists for having cases of exceptional preservation. The first instance is one we might as well look at whilst we're on the head end of the body, and that is that a specimen of Pinacosaurus was found with a preserved larynx, published just last year. The larynx, also known as the voice box, is a structure used for producing vocalisation in tetrapods. These are thought to have varied massively with dinosaurs, producing all sorts of sounds like I mentioned in my dinosaur sound video. But Pinacosaurus shows that ankylosaurs had larynges that were extraordinarily similar to that of birds. This means that they made sounds of incredible complexity for courtship, territorial calls, predator defence or parental care. Now given the wide range of calls that birds make, we can't really get specifically into how it sounded exactly. Just that ankylosaurs likely made some sort of bird-like sound. Now what's interesting here is that ankylosaurs are actually quite distant in terms of their relationship to birds. Which means that A, this is a convergent feature, or B, bird-like vocalisations actually originated long before birds came onto the scene. So what else could have made these kind of noises? Another case of exceptional preservation was described in 2017 by some Ghostbuster nerds who named the new genus Zool. This guy boasts a complete skull and nearly complete tail along with preserved skin tissue, showing non-osteoderm scales that were very softly conical and non-overlapping. Then we come to the nodosaur that has been nicknamed the mummified ankylosaur, a dinosaur that shows soft tissues such as organs, skin and even melanosomes, meaning we know what colour it was. And that is as much as I'm going to spoil with that because I'm going to be doing a full video for that dinosaur soon. Maybe subscribe so you don't miss it. And with regards to the evolutionary story for ankylosaurs, despite how well studied they are, we don't know a huge amount on how they got their start. We think they may have gotten their start in the mid-Jurassic, splitting from their sister group the stegosaurs, but we don't know geographically where from. It also appears that nodosaurs are somewhat more basal, being eventually replaced by the ankylosaurines by the mid to late Cretaceous. Other than that, what we know about ankylosaurs lies mostly in how they were living once they had become successful. Due to the nature of how these remains have been found, these animals were likely solitary, and non-social animals in the wild will often get very territorial, which could explain them fighting each other with those tail clubs. These guys were low-built herbivores, feeding on low-lying vegetation using what is thought to have been a long flexible tongue as suggested by a well-developed hyoid bone. But there have been mentions of possible carnivory in a couple of members of this group. The aforementioned Panacosaurus was speculated to have been an insectivore, using an especially long and flexible tongue like an anteater. But it turns out what they thought was a very well-developed hyoid bone was actually the larynx that I mentioned earlier. One ankylosaur found from early Cretaceous China represents a very unique ankylosaur. Leoningosaurus is one, the smallest ankylosaur, uh, just over a foot long when fully grown, two, the cutest ankylosaur, and three, possibly a semi-aquatic pescivore. Now again, I plan on doing a full video on that guy, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Which brings us very nicely into our Q&A segment. Remember that if you want a question answering, you can get a priority spot for when these windows open by signing up to my Patreon. Alternatively, you can wait for a community post to come on and post your questions there. Please do not put your questions in the comment sections on any of the videos, because they will just get lost, and I don't want to leave anyone out with these questions. And this week's question comes from patron Demetrius Moritidis. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Who has asked... There are many debates about different fossils actually belonging to different species and classification papers go back and forth all the time. We have the likes of Taurosaurus, Nanotyrannus, etc. But what about the opposite? How confident are we that large geographic and temporal distributions aren't different species of the same genus with very similar bone structures? Like those of Pantherinae, aka cats, which to me look very similar. Would a paleontologist of the future recognise those as being different species? Okay, so this is a question that has caused paleontologists some of the biggest problems in the history of the science and is likely to continue doing so. Okay, so how do we know that various specimens that we think are all the same species aren't actually different species of the same genus? 
Now, I'm glad you actually mentioned cats here because they are my favorite example of the variety that can happen within a genus. Remember that a genus name is the first part of a binomial name and is usually the name that people use when mentioning dinosaurs. But lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars are all in the genus Panthera. So they really do vary a lot in appearance, lifestyle, and distribution. But again, these skeletons would look almost identical to a non-cat expert. So how do we actually know that this kind of variation didn't exist in what we think are the same species? To be honest, we don't. So diagnostic features are set out when a new species is described and anything with those same features is put under that name. Problem is, is that you almost never find a complete skeleton and if you find another specimen that has preserved previously unknown parts, you might find that they're different enough to question this. Or even paleontologists could go back and restudy specimens that have already been described and decide that they're different enough to classify as a new species. A recent example of this being Tyrannosaurus macraensis. This was actually named when paleontologists reclassified an old specimen of what was thought to be a Tyrannosaurus rex. So with regards to future paleontologists actually recognizing these as different species, it really kind of depends on how complete their reference points are. Personally, I think that given the variety of life today, I think that there was a huge amount of variety within just a genus of dinosaur that we don't and probably never will see, which makes me sad. Anyway, I hope that answered your question. Please let me know if you want me to expand on anything and thank you for submitting it. And to everyone else, thank you for watching, liking and subscribing if you have. And I'll catch you guys next time.